This session is brought to you by Follett Learning. Follett's vision is to improve the world by inspiring learning and shaping education. Follett is committed to the future of school libraries. As the largest provider of educational materials and technology solutions to school libraries, classrooms, learning centers, and school districts, Follett is ready to help school librarians answer any COVID era challenge. Find out more at FollettLearning.com. So I'm Daryl Burnett. Uh, I cover school finance for Education Week. Um, we're a trade publication, um, covers K-12 education across the country, um, rural, suburban, urban districts across the country. Um, these past couple of months, as you could probably assume, have been kind of crazy. Um, not as crazy as educators' lives, <laughs> people who are actually in the classroom, but trying to keep on top of exactly everything that's happening and how districts are responding to the coronavirus um, has just been a very, um, I would say it's a, been a mind bending experience. Uh, I thought I knew a lot about how education works and I'm just learning so much more these past couple of months. So uh, I took up the school finance beat about a year ago. Um, we were going through a newsroom wide uh, reorganization and I told my editors at that time I was covering um, state politics and I told my editors that I think that there's a lot to better understand when it comes to money I think we conceptualize k-12 money differently today than we did 10 years ago even five years ago um, and I'll get into that in my presentation um, and I found it fascinating that we were I think at that time you know <laughs> um, almost 10 years out of the recession and there were school districts that were still just cutting millions of dollars out of their budget, still laying people off. It just didn't really make any sense to me. Um, so um, that started my coverage, just kind of better understanding some of these nuances as to why districts are still financially struggling when the economy was doing so well and the pandemic hit. So um, that has taken up the last eight months of my life um, obviously because um, this is going to affect almost every school district's budget in the country, so, but in di very different ways. So, um, so here's just the presentation, just kind of going over some of the things that are happening in the K-12 school finance space. Um, a lot of this is before the coronavirus, but I'll get into how the coronavirus has changed that. Um, so first thing I want to establish is that um, money matters. Um, for a long period of time, um, really since 19, in the mid-1960s, there has been a um, ongoing, in my opinion, very unusual debate in the education field as to whether or not money can actually impact um, academics, if it could actually move students' test scores, if it could actually improve students' outcome. And um, that debate is now over. <laughs> I've interviewed several uh, researchers about this. I've interviewed Hanishek, who is infamous for telling people that money does not matter. Um, but the research is clear. Um, more money means better academic outcomes. Um, and um, this really just, it's just the debate between media politicians and Betsy DeVos, who is still convinced that it does not matter. Um, but in fact, I was just writing about this again last week. Um, not only did they find that during the last recession, um, districts that lost, that made se severe budget cuts, um, their test scores declined significantly. Um, and it actually matches like one to one. It's pretty compelling evidence. So, um, so what are some other reasons why money matters? Well, it's a big chunk of our tax dollars. It's about um, half of your property tax dollars. Um, it's a big chunk of income and sales tax dollars. It takes up about half a state's budget. This is a K-12 education specifically. Um, almost any time that you're paying taxes, a portion of that is going to schools. Um, and so that, so in other words, we have a fiduciary duty to pay attention to how schools um, receive money and spend money and um, how our government collects taxes. Um, it can make or break a superintendent's tenure. I'm sure a lot of you guys are well aware of this, but 
um, superintendents who um, mismanage money <laughs> quickly get fired. I've written stories, so I've been an education reporter for about 12 years now, and I've written stories about superintendents purchasing furniture while they're making layoffs and losing their jobs the next year. Um, this is actually one of the reasons why superintendents' contracts are so long nowadays. Like they have all these clauses in them as to like how long they can stay, if they get fired, what would happen, et cetera. And that's because just as districts have gotten more money over the years, superintendents' jobs have become just more and more political. It's just a very politically difficult job. And that's, I mean, it has a lot to do with the fact that they are one of the biggest employers in communities. Um, but they are, they dole out a lot of tax dollars, going back to my last point. So, um, you know, how superintendents and their CFOs manage their budgets um, can make or break them. Um, as I just mentioned, school districts are big employers. Um, they're the biggest, um, they're the biggest, um, and oftentimes they are one of the largest employers in the community. And one of the things that I keep coming across now that the pandemic is leading to all these layoffs is um, all these economists basically saying, well, if you don't bail out schools, um, Congress, um, district layoffs can actually um, prolong a community's recession. So because districts are employing, you know, thousands of people, if they lay off, you know, just, you know, a tenth of their staffing, which is a real, real life scenario for a lot of districts, that could actually um, prolong a community's recession for another year. Um, people will leave, um, people will, you know, be unemployed. Um, it'll burden the welfare system. Um, there will be more uninsured people. Oftentimes, it's a cyclical because um, having, you know, the superintendent laying everybody off, you're basically laying off your students' parents. And so, you know, now you have fewer staff to improve academic outcomes, and your students are now dealing with all the problems that come with more poverty, such as you know, they're hungry, they're tired, there's a lot of domestic issues going on at home, domestic violence, et cetera. So it has a real cyclical effect. Um, and money is at the root of America's inequitable system. So in fact, I'm writing a story right now just about um, a reparations effort in Virginia. And one of the things that I'm just find so fascinating about, um, about Jim Crow era and um, what we, commonly referred to as um, the busing wars in the 50s and 60s is that a lot of the angst around whether or not school districts should merge, whether or not they should bus um, black students into white districts, white students in black districts, et cetera, a lot of that had to do with um, whether or not districts could afford it, whether or not property value would go up or down, and whether or not um, whether whether or not um, districts would have to um, raise taxes. Um, so oftentimes money is really driving things that so we're talking about other things. Um, this comes up all the time. I keep talking to my colleagues about this because you know most of Ed Week's newsroom is people who write about curriculum and teachers, et cetera. And oftentimes like they're talking around money. So they might be talking about whether or not a district is trying to do this one one-to-one -one Chromebook scenario and if it's effective or not. And really, if it's how long it lasts is whether or not the district can afford it, if the district's money is sustainable or not, which I'm going to get into a little bit further. So, um, and then finally, the coronavirus is going to upend everything we understand about um, school finance. Um, one of the things that I keep hearing a lot of people talk about is that the budget cuts are the type of budget cuts that states are looking at are so severe that it might require states to reconsider how they distribute their money and reconsider how districts are divvied up. Um, it's really, it's kind of, um, I guess the best way to put it is kind of breathtaking um, when you look at how much money districts 
could potentially lose in the coming months um, and how fast it would change what a classroom looks like. Um, but it would have a trickle down effect to accountability, um, to um, which districts get money, which don't get money, um, to the charter school world, to vouchers. I mean, it really can offend a lot of how we spend our money. So where does K-12 money come from? Um, so oftentimes there's a misperception as to um, where districts are getting a lot of their money. And that I think has led to a lot of the governance issues that K-12 community has over who actually is in charge, who can actually make the decisions, et cetera. Um, but money comes from, from what makes the K-12 space unusual compared to other government models is that um, the money is coming from three legs of um, three legs of the government. And because of that, it kind of creates like this muddled mess, <laughs> for lack of a better word. So about 10% of the money comes in the federal government. Now I'm talking about average. Districts vary here widely. 40% um, comes from the state, and then another 40% comes from the local government. And then some districts, like the one I used to cover, uh, Memphis, Tennessee, will get a lot of money from philanthropists, and they get a lot of money from grants. Um, but again, this varies depending on your district, and it really depends on um, what state you're in, and then um, most, most importantly, the composition of the demographics of your district. If you have a lot of low-income students, you might be getting a lot of state and federal money, but very little local money. Um, but the reason why this matters is because, as I mentioned before, um, where the money comes from is who your district is answering to. So I think oftentimes we kind of target our ire about spending within districts at school board members. But all these legs, legs of government, the federal, the feds, the state, um, and local government, they all have rules as to how their money should be spent. And that makes it more difficult for administrators because they're basically trying to answer to all sorts of politicians. So if you are upset about a reading program that didn't last for a long period of time or that there's some kind of quirky rule to, et cetera, that might not necessarily be the school board's decision. That might be the federal government's decision. So um, going to the school board might not actually make a difference. Going to school board meeting and complaining might not make a difference. But there's some things that I try to keep in mind as I write about these, um, write about school finance is, um, is the money equitable? Um, so is it being distributed equitably between districts and within districts? Is it adequate? Is, it, is there enough money to um, actually do what it's intended to do? Is it sustainable? This is actually like, what I would argue <laughs> a more important question, especially now than the equitable and adequate question, because if it's not sustainable, that's why you see a lot of churn within a lot of districts. You see a lot of like staff member who might be here today, this school year and not next year. You see a lot of like new grant, uh, you see a lot of initiative, a lot of new initiatives, like every year, like, you know, the government or the superintendent will be saying, oh, we're doing a reading program this year. We're doing a, you know, some math program. That's because they have money for that year and it's not enough money to make it last for two, three, four years long enough to actually see the program's effectiveness or not. So this is where money actually from really start impacting um, academic outcomes. And is it predictable? So one of the big issues for, um, for a lot of low income districts, for districts with high um, concentration of impoverished students is that their money, their students move a lot and their demographics might swing from one year to the next. And that means that it's very difficult for a superintendent to say, we will have this many students next year and the, gov and the governor should give us this much money. This has become a really big issue during with the coronavirus because so many parents now 
especially in big urban districts, are deciding to send their kids to charter schools or private schools. And that means that the superintendent is not going to get the amount of money that they thought that they would get this year. So that means that they're going to have to make uh, mid-year budget cuts. So if there's a recession, how vulnerable is your district to cuts? And this is one of the things that I will, I'll give, I'll give um, the, I'll give you guys a link to, um, hopefully might be able to be posted in the chat, but we've done a database to just show which districts are vulnerable to budget cuts in the coming months. And I was really struck by the variety of how districts um, budget composition so, for example, where they get their money can dictate um, how vulnerable they are to budget cuts. And to be a little bit more explicit, local dollars are very, very stable. And that's because, um, because of all of our tax wars, assessors don't go through neighborhoods reassessing property values on a frequent basis. They might do it every three years, every five years, sometimes every 10 years. So because they're doing so infrequently, um, property values are going to stay pretty consistent or property assessments are going to stay pretty, pretty consistent and those homeowners are going to be paying the same amount of taxes as they did last year, the year before, five years ago, et cetera. It's not going to change that dramatically. Um, sales and income tax, which makes up um, state's budget, so that swings dramatically. And that's where you're getting into why we are experiencing, why K-12 is experiencing such um, drastic budget cuts right now. That's because states' budgets are mostly dictated based off of how the economy is doing, how the stock market is doing, how the oil price is doing. So a lot of um, very unsustainable revenue models. Um, so if I'm a district that is highly impoverished, therefore I don't have a lot of property value, I'm heavily dependent on the state, then that means that that money could go away in a flash. Um, and that's where a lot of low income districts get into a lot of trouble. Even though they are buffered by federal and state dollars, um, state dollars, which is where they get the vast majority of their money, is not sustainable. And as you've probably seen in these last couple of months with Betsy DeVos, you know, griping about whether or not whether or not districts should be able to get a lot of the COVID relief relief money, the CARES Act money, sometimes even federal dollars are not sustainable and predictable. So you're just dealing with just a lot less control, a lot less local control, a lot, a lot more vari variability, a lot of, um, yeah, a lot more. Um, variability over the years. Um, and then, as I should mention too, public opinion about taxes and school funding is shifting very, very quickly. I just wrote a story last week actually about this because um, before the pandemic, there was widespread support amongst Democrats and Republicans that schools should get more money, that governors were leaving, leaving them hanging dry and that had a lot to do with the fact that there were all those teacher protests etc but now that there's a pandemic you got unemployment rate is so high a lot of folks are saying i don't want to pay these taxes i can barely afford to pay my bills let alone all the taxes that i'm being burdened with and so they are pushing back at governors at superintendents at mayors about these high taxes and um that's going to be important in the coming months as more and more districts go to increase their levies. And these levies in the past weren't, past weren't all that successful and they could be even less successful in the near future. So if you guys are following, you can probably kind of see what the problem is with school funding and why I think there's so much frustration and confusion around uh, K-12 dollars. It's very inequitable <laughs> and the money is going to um, very wealthy districts that don't need as much money. So it's really backwards. It can be a very frustrating thing to look at because um, there are districts that have money coming out of their ears. <laughs> they don't know what to do with the money. They're trying to find new ways to spend it. 
and there are districts in which um, they all their kids are poor. They need money to improve their test scores so that they're not punished by the state and given less money next year. But um, you know, the money is not sustainable, it's not equitable, it's not adequate. So it's a really sort of a convoluted corner of K-12 policy. So why has spending gone up so much? So you probably hear a lot of folks use this $700 billion figure. I think it's up to $750 billion now is how much our tax dollars are being spent on schools. Um, for a long period of time, folks said, well, the mil we're still spending more on military than public schools. That's no longer true. We are spending more on public schools than the military. Um, public schools is one of the biggest spenders of tax dollars in the country. But why is that? Um, so in the last 60 years, after the busing wars that I mentioned, um, school districts went about hiring a lot of people. Um, districts fractured. The district consolidation that was taking place across the Northeast, the Midwest, the Northwest, et cetera, stalled. So there's a lot of inefficiencies within the public school system. Um, we expect more from our schools in the last 20 years, as you guys are probably well aware of, post No Child Left Behind. Expectations as to what school districts should be able to deliver has gone up. And I would actually argue that it goes it, it actually predates No Child Left Behind. One of the biggest drivers of that is um, colleges. Admissions officers are actually expecting more from um, high school seniors. So that kind of has a trickle down effect where it's no longer okay to just have taken Spanish course and a French course. Now you have to take like Spanish, French, German, Arabic, and AP courses to get into Harvard. So districts are trying to offer more and more programs after school and in school program services for their students um, so pensions health care and new minimum wage requirements are slow moving hurricane so um pensions is like the <laughs> it's like the monster that's slowly eating away at schools um districts cannot afford to pay their retirees pensions and um, pensions are already woefully underfunded. And the more underfunded they get, the more that districts have to put away for, the more pension costs go up every year. And so there are some states now, such as Illinois, in which the state is spending more on their pension payment than they are on their schools. Um, and there are gonna be more states that are gonna be in that bucket, Connecticut, Kentucky, um, they don't reform their pensions. They have a, um, it's a, um, it's could possibly outstrip their K-12 spending. And then healthcare, um, this is really just a matter of the fact that healthcare costs in general have gone up. Um, and so districts are asking their employees to pay more in healthcare. And then um, districts are competing with the Amazon warehouses and all the other service industries who are now increasing their minimum wage. States are increasing their minimum wage. And that means that the more that the minimum wage goes up, the more districts have to pay for their um, employees. And then today's student body has more needs. I think we are more aware of um, poverty and its effect on children. Um, there are um, students with disabilities, there are um, students uh, need um, not only lunch, they need breakfast. Some districts serve um, dinner for students. Districts need uh, nurses, um, et cetera. So I think as we become more aware of students' needs because of technology, we want to spend more money on their needs too. Um, and then this is one of the biggest drivers. There have been several lawsuits in the last couple of years, last couple of decades, actually starting in the 1980s, that in which state Supreme Courts have ruled that education is a constitutional right, state constitutional right. And as those case, cases kind of move to the court system, um, school districts are trying to, um, states are trying to make spending more equitable. And in order to make it more equitable, States don't take away from rich districts, they just give poor districts more money. 
So overall spending just keeps going up. So mobility, um, the Northeast is losing a ton of students. The South is gaining a ton of students. Both trends require more money. If you're losing more students, transportation costs go up, um, spending is not as efficient, et cetera. Um, as student enrollment goes up or skyrockets, um, districts have to um, hire more teachers, they have to build new school buildings, um, et cetera. So spending is just very, very inefficient. So while this $750 billion number is thrown around all the time, um, I've met teachers who are paid $24,000 a year. I've met teachers who are paid $200,000 a year. So there are districts in which, by a stroke of luck, uh, this actually happened in Texas a couple of weeks ago. Tesla moves into town. Now all of a sudden, Tesla is paying property taxes, and that's a boon for the district. But the district next door, there is no Walmart, there are no stores, and so they have very little money to spend. So it's just very, very inefficient um, between states, within states, and now there's no new data that shows that it's actually inefficient between schools. So a uh, school down the street might be spending twice as much as the school next door. It just, it just depends on, sometimes these decisions are arbitrary, sometimes they're baked into the law. And then tax structure is just very inefficient. I think there was just a lot of frustration. I'm not going to get into the rabbit hole of taxes, but a lot of frustration as to the fact that the GDP, America's GDP is sky high. Um, and yet um, we still have buildings in which bricks are falling out of the building. Just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> um, so the governance structure, as I mentioned in the last slide, is just really screwed up. And because of that, you have a lot of redundancies within the system. Sometimes states, municipalities, and federal governments, sometimes they will have the exact same initiative, but they're spending the money in a very different way, and they have different rules for that initiative. And so what you see on the ground is just very different. Um, so one of the things that's really screwed up about school spending is that money is distributed, the vast majority of money is distributed based off of funding formulas. These funding formulas have gotten really, really old. The older that they get, the more the inequitability, the more inequitable and inadequate school spending is. So state school funding formulas are supposed to be progressive, meaning that poor districts will get more money. That's just not usually the case. They're really old. The average funding formula is around, um, I think it's like 15, it's almost 20 years old now. Um, the average funding formula, the they, states, um, experts suggest that they are replaced every decade. So there are some states like Delaware and Nevada in which funding formula is actually like 50, 60 years old. So that means that the funding formula when it was, when it was crafted um, did not consider all kinds of new things, which I'm going to get into a little bit later. But they're really inequitable. There are several states in which um, you're spending millions of dollars more on rich districts than you are on poor districts, and that creates all kinds of problems, legal problems in addition to academic problems. Um, they don't weigh students appropriately. Like one of the interesting debates that's going on right now is what does an impoverished student look like? So the, Fed, the feds don't really look at that. Like their measurement of free and reduced lunch is pretty much expired. They don't use that as a measurement anymore. And so because of that, states have to come up with their own definition of poverty. And these definitions are all over the place. Um, and because states have such inadequate definitions of poverty, oftentimes they're spending money on kids who are not poor are not spending money on kids who are extremely poor. So that, as you can probably tell, can create problems. And this is one of the things that I don't think um, gets looked at enough, but they don't, states really don't cap local property values effectively. And so you'll see um, really rural areas, really wealthy suburbs 
tax the hell out of their residents. Um, you know, just, you know, I've talked to residents who, you know, their property tax bill is three, four, five, six, seven thousand dollars a year. They're only living in a, you know, <laughs> two bedroom townhome. Um, and that's because the state is not actually telling that minister, telling that superintendent, you can, that superintendent of the school board, you cannot tax as much. So that's a huge issue that I think has um, kind of skewed where money is being distributed. Um, and they provide some schools with a lot more money than they need and schools with a lot less money that they need. And then finally, districts aren't designed the way that they were when state funding formulas were created. Um, so the biggest twist being charter schools. They just weren't around when funding formulas were created. And so um, charter schools are oftentimes really underfunded and their funding is really convoluted in the way that local charter schools um, divvy up money that otherwise would be going to the local public school is really complicated and convoluted and oftentimes not fair. So um, oftentimes legislatures will basically because they don't want to replace a funding formula, they will create these categorical funding. And that's where a lot of what I was talking about before, sustainability issues come in because um, you have these categories such as like, oh, the legislature this year passed, I keep using this analogy, but oftentimes that's what it is, a new reading initiative. Um, and then next year they get rid of that initiative because it's so easy to get rid of. So these funding formulas matter. Don't ignore them. They might look complicated, but they really matter at the end of the day. Um, so new school facilities is a totally different matter. It's really regressive, meaning poor districts oftentimes struggle trying to raise enough money to buy a building. And this is one of the areas in which um, gets this districts into a lot of trouble because they're taking out huge bonds that they can't pay off. Um, so totally separate from where districts get their money typically. So what's wrong with teacher pay? Uh, teacher pay comprises almost 80% of district's budget. And this is where um, there's been a lot of contention even before the coronavirus. And there's probably going to be even more attention to it now because teachers are being asked to teach in hazardous conditions. Um, there was already a shortage beforehand, partially because in several districts there was a shortage beforehand, partially because of pay in many districts was so low. Um, and um, before the coronavirus, there were all these protests, the Red Fred movement, which I think just kind of threw everybody for a loop. Um, so districts spend new money that they get on all sorts of things other than teacher salaries. Um, oftentimes they just hire more teachers or instead of giving teachers a pay raise, they will hire more paraprofessionals since teachers are asking for help in the classroom. Um, sometimes they will buy a new curriculum. Um, the pensions, healthcare, <laughs> um, hiring more teachers to reduce class size. Sometimes there's a new academic initiative. Um, there's all kinds of debt for school buildings, et cetera. Um, and one of the things that I think, as I pointed out as to why I took this beat originally, is they are reeling from the recession. So they're still trying to recover from the recession. So they're trying to repair all the harm that was done during the last recession. Um, so teacher pay has remained mostly stagnant. Um, there are some districts in which teachers haven't gotten a raise in years. Um, it definitely has been able to keep up with, um, keep up with price of living increases and it definitely hasn't been able to compete with other sectors. And this is why a lot of districts are losing teachers and librarians, it's because you can get paid so much more having a master's degree, two master's degree in other, other fields. Um, but it exacerbates teacher shortages. I mean, you know, um, superintendents, uh, human resource officers are making officers teachers and they just can't compete with surrounding districts. So um, America has yet to define what a good teacher is. And because of that, um, they are still paying teachers based off of how many years of experience they've had. And um, 
that incentivize teachers to stay in a district for a very long period of time. But um, with the coronavirus pandemic, it's shown that districts have a difficult time trying to convince teachers to um, retire when they can't afford it or come back into the field when they need them. Uh, teachers are being asked to do more, but pay, being paid less to do those things. And concentrated poverty at schools has become very, very expensive for districts. Um, they usually hire more staff, as I pointed out before, to reduce class sizes, rather than paying teachers more to work at these schools. So um, again, one of the weird things about K-12, usually the more difficult the job, the better the pay. K-12 industry, the more difficult the job, <laughs> the less the pay. So it's just a weird thing about school spending. And as I should point, should point out, teachers have found new ways to organize. And I think a lot of this has to do with social media. Um, teachers are organizing in these Facebook groups. Um, they are gathering together for rallies. They are revealing each other's pay to each other. Um, and this is kind of appended the um, what I call the field of secrecy, the veil of secrecy that's long shrouded K-12 spending. Because we don't know how the money is spent, um, it's easy to disengage the general public around school spending. But as more and more teachers are telling the general public, here's how much I get paid, it's not fair, the teacher down the street who's worked less than me or has a more difficult job than me, Etc. is getting paid this much, it's not fair. So I think there's just more public awareness about teacher pay. So here are some fiscal debates that were happening before the pandemic that I should go through. And I don't think that these debates are going to go away. I think that they're just going to become more politicized, um, especially considering which administration um, is going to be elected this November. Um, but school finance, again, the um, it is the linchpin of taxpayers of America's taxing structure. So um, this is why it just gets so political and so um, I think why there's so much sensitivity. Governors have resigned over school spending, so just can't understate it enough. Um, funding formulas are really old; they're inefficient. I pointed out before that. With the pandemic, it might require states to um, replace these. Um, teacher pay, teachers aren't getting paid enough. Some teachers are getting paid too much. Um, minimum wage, there's a big, I'm sure you guys have heard of it, the fight for 15. About a quarter of district staffing are low wage workers, cafeteria workers, um, paraprofessionals, um, recess monitors. Um, there are just a ton of people within school buildings that make less than $15 an hour. So as the Fight for 15 movement um, gains momentum, it means districts are going to have to dole out more money to compete with the Amazon warehouses. Um, pension reform. Um, should feds, states, or the districts control school spending? I kind of went over this before. Fiscal transparency. There's just a lot of curiosity as to how money is being spent. There's a new requirement by the feds to reveal how much money is being spent on every school, which people didn't understand before. Um, and then special education costs are just going to continue to go up. Um, yes. So, um, and then school facilities. This is a huge issue with the coronavirus because school buildings are on average 40 years old. They have poor ventilation. Um, there's mildew, cleaning supplies are inefficient, and now that schools are trying to reopen, all these issues are coming to the fore. Um, so as politicians have asked of educators for decades now, they want money being spent in a more effective way. They want to see that their money is being put to good use, that test score is actually increasing, and so there's going to be more asking of districts to show proof um, that they deserve to get the amount of money that they're getting. And this really gets into the accountability systems. As I mentioned before, um, school spending is now um, being asked, districts are being asked to reveal how much they are spending on each individual school. And in the past, we've understood 
how much districts spend on average per student. So this is a different way to understand school finance. So now that there's a pan pandemic, what are the debates that I, I, I predict will be um, very hot? So will there be a big bailout? That's a big issue that um, I think Congress is going to reconvene in the coming weeks, early September. They could bail school districts out. Right now, they are talking about a hundred billion dollar bailout, which is um, for that's for higher ed and K twelve. And I think seventy billion dollars of that goes to K twelve. And then of that seventy billion dollars, two thirds of that only goes to the schools that decide to open this fall. So. By our tracking, the vast majority of schools have not reopened. Therefore, the vast majority of schools will not get more, more bailout cash. So where will any bailout cash go? And this kind of goes to the heart, too, of like how states are going to cut. But um, they typically use Title I formula. And Title I formula, um, oftentimes people just assume that goes to districts with more poor students. That is not the case. It typically goes to districts with a lot of poor students in big urban areas, rural districts sometimes lose out in this process because their um, poverty is more spread out and not as concentrated. So how will decide, states decide how to cut their budgets? They could just do flat funding cuts, which usually means poor districts are going to lose out more than wealthy districts. They could do a a progressive cut where they cut more from wealthy districts and poor districts, but no matter how you cut it, poor districts are likely going to be most devastated and states are going to have to decide if they should cut from their K-12 budget, their higher ed budget, their public health budget, um, their prison budget. So how much they're going to shield the K-12 system from budget cuts, I think is going to be a big issue. Um, can districts afford to teach remote? So remote learning is very expensive because um, you require new technology. Um, it's very difficult to pull off academically. Um, and then if they're going to teach in person, that's even more expensive because you have all the PPE, the masks, those hand sanitizer, et cetera. And then you have to pay more people to come into school buildings to avoid student crowding. So what are some things you should know about your district school finances? And I try to encourage people to engage in all three levels of governance, the feds, the states, and the local. But it can sometimes be overwhelming to do that. Um, the federal debate over school spending, I think, oftentimes consumes the most attention, though that money is the least amount of money that districts get. And superintendents can sometimes care less about federal spending. State spending is really, the bulk of where a lot of the action happens, but I think school boards have a lot more power than people understand. They are the final stamp of approval for school districts' budgets. So if I were you, I would try to better understand where my district gets its money, who controls how that money is being spent, and how do they control it? Do they control it just through policies, through politicizing, um, through their rhetoric? Um, how they control that um, money matters. Um, how much your teacher is being paid? How is that determined? Now that we know how much money is being spent at every single school, you could typically start assuming how much teachers in those schools are getting paid. And that matters because oftentimes we are giving money to the academically struggling or we're giving money to the academically successful schools, not enough money to the academically struggling schools. And we're cutting, especially during the coronavirus, we're cutting from the academically struggling schools, making their problems even more difficult. So we're like compounding the problem. And so how does spending compare with surrounding district spending? I think that that's just an important question. So you can just better understand contextually just um, how your school spending revenue model compares to other districts in the area. This varies just dramatically as I've explained before. So when are teacher contracts negotiated? How are they negotiated? I think in recent years, there's just been a lot of distrust between um, teacher union activists, teacher, teachers at large, and superintendents funding scenarios. Oftentimes they are trying to explain to district, to teachers 
that they're broke, that they can't afford raises, that they can't afford, um, you know, new paraprofessionals, that they can't afford new school buildings, et cetera. The teachers just flat out just don't believe them. And so there's been a big call for new and a better arbitrary process to avoid a lot of the strikes that we've seen in the last couple of years. But all of it has to do with the negotiation process. There's just a lot of distrust. And that has a lot to do with the fact that there's just so little transparency. How much is in your district reserves? This matters greatly because districts are pull, going into their reserves right now to pay for all the unexpected costs surrounding the coronavirus pandemic. The PPEs, the online learning, the Chromebooks, et cetera, all that is coming out of savings account. And this is a very inequitable corner of school finance because some districts, because they have a conservative um, CFO, they've saved a ton. Other districts haven't saved anything. So this just varies by district. And if I'm sitting on a district, I'm in a district where a district is sitting on a pile of cash, you might be able to survive the next three years, which is how long people say the coronavirus recession is going to last. Um, if I'm sitting in a district in which I have no money in my savings account, which is a very real life scenario, I'm screwed. And I should be bracing for layoffs in the coming weeks or months. How much do homeowners pay in taxes? I would just be aware of that only because that gives insight into the political sentiment for homeowners to pay either more or less and how much they trust their superintendent to spend money effectively and efficiently. So I think that's it. Um, as I said before, um, I think that, um, you know, this all these issues are going to be very relevant in the coming months um, and I think it's probably going to um, the political debate is going to evolve drastically um, but I should be around for if you have any more questions.